Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the uh, Streetworks UK conference, the uh, uh, last session of day on, on day one, having had a fantastic session from uh, uh, Matt Warman earlier on and Clive Selly just now, for those of you who are with us through the uh, uh, CEO of OpenReach. But we're now uh, going to uh, dive down really into some of the stuff that which is, uh, um, should we say, our traditional bread and butter in terms of what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, whether that is between utility and contractor and affiliate, whether it's between utility and authority or highway, or whether it's between utility in partnership with government, other government departments and authorities uh, representing the public sector as a, as a WANA. And it's, a, it's, it's such a vital and important area um, and, you know, has been a key feature, frankly, from Streetworks for, 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 for many, many decades between the operators and between, between all the players I've just touched on. Um, you, some of you on the call will be aware that the Hawk Vision outlines ambition that, that, that is to reinforce this collaborative approach, which David and I have signed into and which is strongly supported. And as I touched on this morning, actually one of the first, as we say, pledges by one of our larger PLCs has written to me only this morning to say, we utterly support this element and collaboration sits there strongly in terms of the values of the organization, the importance to them. But we have, let me introduce them on the panel this afternoon. I don't think there'll be any strangers necessarily to many of you on the call who are in leadership roles. Uh, but for those of you who may not have met them, let's say from the affiliates or indeed from the uh, other, other areas, um, uh, uh, less peripheral to our expert practitioner groups. Um, firstly, let me introduce David Capon um, in front of the Blue Jag UK and Geoplace, which tells its own story as CEO of Jag UK, um, an employee of Geoplace, um, but significantly co-chair of Hawk UK and responsible for the 237, I always use that figure on, I think it's nearer 297, isn't it, David? Uh, authorities, as you can, you can tell us about shortly in, in a second. And in a few moments, I'll ask David to say a few remarks. Um, some before, supporting and, 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 and giving a, 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 a parallel view at the same time is uh, Samantha. Uh, I think every, just about everybody on the call will be aware of the extraordinary work Samantha does in terms of leading up the uh, management team of Streetworks UK and the extraordinary work she did on the coordination code and other areas over, over many years. And in many ways, uh, it drives at the backbone and has been at that area of coordination and collaboration, you know, as long as Streetworks has been in existence, it seems. Um, the third colleague we have on the call um, is Sally Kendall from DFT. Um, some of you may have seen, she flashed up on the screen there, has gone away again. I think she's just having some problems dialing in, but she's on third anyway, but we'll see um, how, we, how we go with that and if we can tie her in. Um, let me uh, re-echo the point um, earlier on. Uh, the, se the session is being recorded, please be aware of that. And um, I'd also was wanted to touch on um, the, uh, 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 if you wish to ask any questions, really welcome your questions. Please just write them into the chat tote not the Q&A tote. So use the chat tote for any questions and that allow the participants to ready themselves as we cycle through to some of the questions. Um, I'd like to, you know, finally just say a very big thanks to our sponsors Atkins and SKU-B for actually making this, uh, this session feasible and possible for us today. So um, the, the, the type of areas that we'd asked colleagues to talk about in terms of trying to really get to grips with you know, what this, you know, newfound era of, of collaboration has seen, I would say, in the, in the COVID area is, is what does collaboration mean to them? And, you know, why is it, why is it actually important? What are the, what are the barriers they might see or perceive and, and what is required to overcome these barriers? And, and indeed, how does their organization or organizations, which they represent in David's case, um, collaborate with others to deliver their street works and, and you know, maybe flesh out with some examples. So I'm going to ask each of them to speak probably for, you know, about six or eight minutes each in terms of laying, laying out the ground. Then we'll move to, to questions after that. Um, David, if you're content, why don't I ask you to uh, crack on and, and give us your first round of views on collaboration as a starter. Thank you. 
Absolutely. Uh, thanks very much, Clive. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd just like to say I'm really happy to be able to get this opportunity to speak to you all. Um, collaboration. Now, Clive has alluded to it probably earlier. Collaboration is a subject we've talked about endlessly within the industry, right back from 1991 when NERSWA was first come, came into power. And I was sort of struggling about what was the sort of theme I and the message I wanted to get across because, you know, I could look back at slides 10, five years ago where we've said probably all the things that could I could say right now. But I think we have come to a moment in time where it's really time that we stop the sort of deliberating and we really need to get on and do something here. We've got a golden opportunity now to move forward and I think we need to seize that opportunity. And yes, we've got strategic drivers, you know, government policy, national, regional and local. You've got your regulators, your shareholders, we've got stakeholders. There's an increase and push for economic development, which is gonna drive a demand increase. We've also got the problem of resilience, which COVID has shown up. There are gaps that we need to um, bridge. There's problems with resources, and that's probably the sort of genesis in some respects of the Hawk UK vision, where we've got these five strategic aims and collaboration is, you know, it's no coincidence that collaboration is in there. We talk about barriers and if you look at the sort of barriers you know yes we could say oh well it's it's regulation it's it's the regulator it's the uh, framework which we all ought to operate in it's the systems it's the data the field of operation is difficult corporate responsibility is not there i know highway authorities have have a real issue with what they perceive for instance as corporate responsibility is just being contracted down to the, the person who's doing it on the ground and it loses its sort of strategic hold but actually when you look at the barriers and everything is out there from my perspective right now the biggest barrier is us us as an industry we have not really grabbed this collaboration theme we really just talk about it because there are 101 other jobs i accept have got to be done but this is now the time to flip this on its head and look at collaboration as an opportunity and something that we should be thinking of at each time. Um, so what could we do? I mean, the technology is there now. We, for instance, within JAG UK, we've worked with um, OpenReach and One.Network and are coming up with a collaborative opportunity. We're trying to test some theories within the city of Sheffield. And I think it was alluded to earlier this morning. We're also having a discussion within the Liverpool city region, see if we can come up with a, a way that we could look at forward planning and change all of that. And what we've got to make is collaboration the norm and not the exception. And we need to build incentives, not wield the stick. We've got to deliver the carrot. We've got to look at forward planning as the way forward and we've got to make communications better. But one of the other things we've got to do is make this simple. We are, as an industry, are making something that should be simple, over complicated. And I think, again, we've got to work together as an industry and define our own future here. Because if we don't sort this out, someone else is probably going to sort it out on our behalf and we'll get another set of regulations and then we've really lost the momentum again. So we've got to make it simple. We've got to have better data. We've got to have programs that are transparent. We've got to be consistent in how we deliver, deliver this. We've got to come up with systems that allow us to be agile. And that's where we are at the moment. We're trying out the use of new technology, such as within One.Network, to see whether we could have a view of what's happening on the network at any one time, this single view of the street about what's happening. And then before you even apply for a permit or a, try a notice, you can see what's actually happening. And on that screen, you should be able to see, well, actually, they're wanting to go down that road. I can go down that road because I'm sure we could work together. And that's what we've really got to do. So really the message to the industry from certainly from me as CEO of JAG UK is, it, is us is the barrier. The technology is there, 
but we could all work better together. Thank you. All right, David, thank you for that. And thanks for laying out that ground. You've been very clear in terms of the, should we say the physical and some of the processes for doing that. Uh, simplicity, uh, data-driven, uh, transparency you touched upon, um, having agile systems that allow some really good networking and visibility of what everyone is doing. Let's come back to some of those themes. Any questions, please put them in the chat tote as we go. Um, I'm going to turn next now then to Samantha, not by way of giving a response to any of those points that David has made, but really just to draw on, on her experience of time in the industry and how she feels about collaboration. And then we'll come on to uh, uh, Sally after that. So over to you, Samantha, next. Good afternoon, everybody. So when we talk about collaboration, we talk about lots of different ways in which we can work together. So there's the traditional chance sharing, there's working in the same traffic management, there's working on special engineering difficulty bridges together and then you know there's working internally within an organization so collaborating as for me western power we're working on a street let's do as many jobs on that street at the same time a big area of potential collaboration is on new developments and dave's i'm not going to repeat what dave has said so but the talk about forward planning there are, there's a lot of work that goes on that small duration work such as connections to new development which may not fall in forward planning but we need to bring into the collaborative sphere when we also talk about new connections um, we need to remember the competition and connection side of things for certain sectors such as electricity where it's not just the statutory undertaker that does the work there will be other um, parties involved such as section 50 license holders so we need to think across not just the hawk community but the wider utility community when we talk about collaboration and the other thing is there are other ways of collaboration that we've probably not even touched on that don't you know there's collaborating on innovation um, there's collaborating on knowledge sharing all those sorts of things so when we think about collaboration it's not just the Heineken advert it's not just the trench in the street it's all the other ways it can be done now why we would do this I don't think I need to go through that list it is to make things better and as a responsible organization we want to make things better we want to work in the environment we work in in the best way possible so collaboration is an easy way to achieve a lot of our own objectives but why aren't we doing it why isn't it the first choice that we pick up when we're deciding how we work so I think one of the key areas is just identifying the opportunities for collaboration. Now, now we're moving in England, particularly with Street Manager, I think this will open up new ways of being able to identify opportunities for this type of work in the future. So that's, it's an area that's a problem at the moment, but there is a solution if we exploit the possibilities of Street Manager in the future. So once we've managed to identify an opportunity for collaboration, why then don't we go ahead and do it? So there is an issue with the regulation and the regulatory framework in which we work, both from the economic regulators, but also some of the street works legislation. If I just take a small little example, so I talked a few seconds ago around internal collaboration, but if I'm working in a permit scheme area and I want to do two different activities, say a new connection and a maintenance job in the same street, that requires two separate permits. So from a, a basic economics and making things easier point of view, there is no incentive to do those works at the same time if you still have to go through the process of applying for permits and potentially having all those issues that we have around clashes or apparent clashes on the street. So we need to look at how that type of thing can be done better in the future. Then I think um, there are the incentives that we would need from the regulators. We have time to quote new connections, those sorts of things. So this would need to be built into that to make it easier to do collaboration rather than more difficult and 
we don't want collaboration to put us at risk of failing some of our other obligations that are very important to us as organisations. Then the other, the other two main points are the sharing of costs. Who picks up the cash, the bill for the collaboration? So is it who pays for the reinstatement? Who pays for the traffic management? There is no framework. There is no um, way that this is easily done. And it is done on the moment on a bespoke basis and it needs to be fair and equitable in the future so it's easy to understand and easy to put into practice and then the final one the one that us utilities always mention and we always bring up is the liability so the liability for the admin side of it who puts the permit in who's responsible if there's fpns on the permits what happens on site who's responsible for the SLG and all of the liability issues around the public safety when the works are in progress and then who's responsible for that reinstatement guarantee following the completion of the works and who actually does the reinstatement on the works. So what we want to do is look at all these issues and start to bring them into the coordination code of practice as a framework in a new appendix E. So from today what I would really find useful is any examples such as the GLA or Wales and West to bring forward and say these are ways we can practically make this work and let's put this into our code of practice to make it guidance for everybody. Samantha, <laughs> Samantha what, a, what a positive treatise and, uh, and, and, and really stimulated us there in terms of you know you're absolutely right you're pointing to those other avenues of collaboration across innovation and and networks processes and things like that probably things we haven't really considered that strongly across uh, uh, different um, uh, entities to date that, that's that's a great point uh, you you touch very elegantly upon the the street manager possibilities which i'm absolutely hope our dft colleague will wax on in 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 short order and i'll invite say to come on there in a, in a in moment's few um, you do point to the economics and uh, uh, of it, and I'm sure David will want to come back in terms of, um, of, of of that in the context of permits. But but I think importantly, you also touch on where those costs and liability issues fall, which is a which which which, which is a which is a, a a great thing to work through, and and indeed the regulator's role in incentivising that and making that really really positive. So. Look, I hope this is starting to give people some really encouraging thoughts on the call. I see we've got massive numbers, 43 participants on the call at the moment. And um, Sally, what better time than me to turn it over to you to give us um, um, a few thoughts, let's say from, the, from the, the department, the owning department of Streetworks in terms of how you see it. I know you've got a mute symbol on, but you're coming in on two areas so I think we can hear you when you start to speak if not I'll let you know straight away. Uh, thanks Clive yeah hopefully you can hear me. Um, had a few technical issues due to DFT security restrictions but there you go I think we've got it to work and um, yeah so thanks everyone and um, uh, thanks for inviting me to this session today. Um, I think I might just start by mentioning you know just coming at this from a slightly different angle you know about why it's important um, so as somebody who sits in DFT uh, and you know I'm responsible for the overall policy on street works my interest is to make sure that those works can be planned and managed as effectively as possible we all know that everyone hates road works and being caught up in traffic jams we also know that those works need to take place and we all have ideas about how they can be better managed to reduce the impact um, but from the road user perspective you know they just want to know when are the works happening how long they will take and when the road's being cleared uh, but we know that they also don't want that same piece of road to be dug up within a few days or the following week and i'm sure we've all asked ourselves that question as road users about you know why can't these works just be coordinated all a little bit better uh, and for the sector itself um, it's likely to become increasingly difficult as we know to maybe book road space We've all heard of the, about the rising numbers of works, not just for the telecom sector, but I know the gas and the electricity and the water sectors are all doing major programmes at the moment, as well as local authorities themselves. Um, so surely it makes sense, you know, we've all talked about this for a number of years, but it does make sense to look at what we can do to have more joint works and better collaboration. 
it seems like you know there's games uh, to be had for everyone here um, and I also know you know I've been around this job for a while and we seem to have been talking about these changes and how they've been needed for quite some time now uh, but I think the time is ripe actually and ready for us actually to start putting some of these changes into practice um, Samantha's just helpfully outlined some of the issues but you know we're very good as a sector at tackling issues and coming up with constructive and productive ways forward and surely you know between ourselves we can come up with solutions to some of the issues um, and that's what collaboration actually means to me you know how we can all work together how can we communicate with each other uh, for everyone's benefit you know just to work in a simpler better more productive way um, and Claude just mentioned street manager you know I've enjoyed collaborating with you all over the last few years not just about street manager, but also the changes we brought to the SROH and some of the most recent regulatory improvements. And even over the summer, we've had some workshops about maybe the next wave of regulatory improvements that we could make. Um, so I'm interested in hearing today about any ideas you have, whether it is regulations, you know, what can I do as DFT to help here? Uh, what more could we do to make use of street manager to help enable and support some of these joint works? Uh, and yes, let's highlight the good practice. Let's flag where the issues are and let's see how we can, um, you know, put things in place that will overcome them. And um, so I know that many of you have heard various, you know, projects and good examples over the years about how coordination is happening out there. Uh, and there's been some really great projects. Um, but I also know it's been mostly about major projects uh, and it's been mostly perhaps where there's been a HA planner or a coordinator involved and they've helped to play that key role in bringing people to the table, supporting that communication, overcoming some of those issues and questions about who pays, who does the paperwork, etc. Uh, and I think the real challenge here though is about the rest of the works. So, you know, we know that 80% of the works that take place are minor, standards and immediates. Obviously, immediates need to happen when they need to happen. But is there scope here to do more uh, about joint works and collaboration on the standards and the minors? Appreciate this is maybe a little bit more difficult to do. Uh, but since they're the majority of the works, shouldn't we be tackling that area? Um, and I've also heard people talk of barriers. But are these really barriers? You know, are these actual really blockers? Or um, are they just, um, you know, things that we have to overcome? Or find some common agreements? Or put some common protocols in place to help people overcome them? Um, and I think we can achieve a lot here in this space, um, working with, you know, working across um, high authorities and promoters alike. Um, but yeah, there's lots of questions I have, and maybe we'll come through. Some, you know, we'll get through some of these as we go through the session. But as I said, I'm very interested to hear about any examples you've got, any um, you know, any ideas that you have, and any specific measures that we can take. Okay, we have a couple of questions in the tote there. One of which is from David to his colleagues, which we'll come to in a second. But before we uh, come on to that, can I just uh, just go around the panel and just look at you know, this last period of nine months and taking, you know, what's happened during COVID as a, as a model, what, what have each of you learned most about collaboration um, uh, in our sector in, 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 in COVID terms? And maybe I could come to you first on that, David. Yeah, I think there's a number of lessons here, Clive. I think the first thing is it's shown that we can collaborate and we can do collaborate really well but it's it's not only are we collaborating at a works level we're you know all the way up the food chain if you like we're collaborating so we've got the hawk uk vision uh, you and i talk regularly now clive so that's a form of collaboration you know there's a number of things which has begun to open up because we've been discussing these issues on a regular basis now we're beginning to have better conversations about this subject and I, there, the other thing that I really point out is technology is not a barrier anymore. Even to deal with emergencies and minor works, if you had a dynamic map that you could see, you could see what's going on and you could see the opportunities for collaboration on an, an hourly basis almost, you know, with 
the works and everything coming through street manager and other network management products you can see what's happening on your network so the technology isn't the barrier well, it's let's just the, it's just the, it's just we've got to develop the process to do it and yes there's lots of little things that you've got to iron out about you know the the permits bit and who's in who's in charge and who what about the reinstatement there's lots of little bits but they're not barriers anymore that they're just serious conversations where we've got to work something up david thank you for that. let's come back to the technology versus mindset issue in a second uh we would we don't want to lose that point in particular samantha can i come to you about COVID in a time of covid um would you echo david's view that we've 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 improved our collaboration during COVID? Yeah, I think the sort of two main points I would make is that we've, interestingly enough, perhaps improved our communication. So I think the um, one of the, whether we call it a benefit or not, of this whole situation has been the proliferation of video calls. Um, so it is easier to have those virtual but face-to-face -face conversations to get things agreed and done in a much quicker way than arranging a meeting, you know, in some city far away. So I think it's made us much faster at responding to things. And secondly, I'm probably more importantly is because of um without getting too grand in all of this because of this collective um difficulty we've gone through as a country and in fact as a world we are i think looking at other people's perspective and we are seeing things from the same point of view and we are and if we take it back to a streetworks point of view rather than a global pandemic perspective we are working to the same objectives we're not pushing against each other we're pulling together in the same direction and i think with the communication improvement and this collective um, perspective on the world i think that has changed some some mindsets definitely Okay, so it's 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 about communication being so much easier enabled and and offering that perspective. That's that's really helpful to hear that. And I think you acknowledge it's been there's been an increase. And obviously, Sally, for you and I, one of the things in all this is that we that we lock this in. But what's your what's your takeaway about collaboration in a in a COVID environment, Sally? Um, well, I think um, I think. I think as a streetworks community, we actually have a real strength in the fact that we have this community, you know, in place. We're used to talking to each other. We're used to dealing with each other. Um, and I think that was a real strength when the lockdown initially happened, because obviously ourselves with David, but also the Scots and the Welsh, we got together very early on to help produce the series of Hawk Notes that I think have been really helpful in supporting the industry through the obviously challenges that we had this year and then also obviously we had works that cancelled needed to be rebooked and rescheduled and again i think there's a real strength there uh, for people in being able to talk to each other plan those works in hopefully there was a bit more coordination going on maybe there were even some joint works uh, i haven't really heard about that but um i think we've got a good foundation in place and as i said our uh, I realise there's issues, I realise there's details to be worked through. I'm starting to see some of the questions appearing now, flagging some of these issues and questions. Uh, but we have the foundation there now with Street Manager. David mentioned we need a dynamic map of works that are coming up. Well, that exists now, it's in Street Manager. Even if you don't use it to raise your permits, you can at least go and look at the map as a user might help with some of your planning uh, going on um, and you know we have ambitions to get more information in there maybe more for our plans in time could go in there as well to help with that planning beyond the immediate period of time as well um, so it's good it's good to flesh out what the issues are but again i'm sure that you know we can use the foundations we've already got in place to come up with some positive and constructive solutions Okay, Sally, thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. Positive and constructive solutions. Absolutely right. I think we, you know, we, we, I think we know what some of the key challenges are, but it's, 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 it's really trying to see those solutions and seeing, seeing how best to bring those to the table. Um, 
some of the questions here are Brigade 2 together, one from Claire Barnes at 223 and Adam Brunskill at uh, 226. He's basically talking about the uh, question, the point that, um, that Samantha brought up earlier about liability. And if you look at the, um, the question there from Claire, what about you, how do you, how do you determine liability? And then Adam expands that slightly and says that Samantha alluded to a major barrier between statutory and his liabilities for both site safety, SLG, permit costs, condition costs, and long-term liability of reinstatements in line with guarantee periods. Would it be possible to outline an end-to-end -end process, including identification of the other works promoters working within the area, and key principles around agreeing liabilities and the benefits of working in a collaborative manner. Um, who wants to have a go at that first? Not sure where it would best lie. Okay, Samantha, go ahead. Um, it's not really an answer, but it's a, um, it's a proposal. <laughs> so within the coordination code review we did this year, collaboration was like a paragraph in the old code. Now we've made it into, you know, a couple of pages, but there's still some more work to do. And one of the things we really want to come up with is some almost framework agreements around the liability side of things. Now, there are different ways to collaborate so there will be different requirements for different framework agreements so what i would like is anyone who um has some views on this or some experience and i know there are some projects currently going on for different parts of collaboration across the country let's use those as good practice starting points to start to develop this um this framework to to lay out where liability could fall. It's something that we have to deal with. We can't just pretend that liability isn't an issue because it is. So we need to come up with a way that makes it clear and easy to use for those non-streetworks people who are responsible for planning jobs so they can see it and understand how they plan their jobs in a collaborative way with other utilities or authorities or Section 50 license holders to make this as easy as possible to do. So these are the problems we need to resolve. If I had the answers right now, then that would be fantastic. But I think it's best that in a way we work collaboratively to come up with the answers to this um, liability issue. So you, so you support the uh, identification of this whole end-to-end -end process in, 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 in all its manifestations. Indeed, you see it as being part of the coordination code, Samantha. Absolutely, because if, co if collaboration isn't coordination, then I'm really not quite sure what it is. So absolutely, but it's a huge piece of work to do, which is why we haven't been able to complete it yet. And there could be some, you know, questions that we need support from the DFT from a, a regulatory point of view to help identify liability. Um, clearly, one of the ways that we've often referred to as a solution, and I'm only going to say this because I think it'd be interesting to hear Dave's perspective is, you know, where there is a large collaborative job, let's hand the reinstatement back to the authority to do in order to resolve the liability issue in those scenarios. Let's Absolutely hand it back to you, so. David. <laughs> Absolutely. As long as you give us the right amount of money, the job will be done. <laughs> but one of the points I would make, and this is not pushing aside the question of liability, but it's really interesting to note that whenever we talk about any change, the first thing the industry comes up with is a negative. What about the li liability? But as I see it, it's, that's an issue we've got to sort out but that shouldn't divert us away from the original goal of trying to collaborate. Now, building a framework seems to me a sensible one. Building a framework that's built on incentives seems to be the way the industry responds better. And I think permits, partly, lane rental certainly has shown us that an incentive-based process means that the industry changes quicker than the, the previous regulatory processes that we've had. So. And yes, it could be you hand the, the liability back, but in terms of we'd, we'd do the final reinstatement, but don't forget NERSWA was brought in because we were really poor at it back in the 1980s. So <laughs> it's not without its um, discussion points on that. But that I was, think we have- 
you know, that was a long time ago, though. I was there. All the model agreements, I've been through it all. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a golden opportunity now to just start afresh and look at this thing totally different. Okay. And I think okay, good. All right. Well, we that, 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 that's a great starting place. Now, now, Sally, I know you don't want to... Uh, are you waving at us, Sally, or...? Yes, I just wanted to come in on this. No, no, I'm bringing you in. Just a minute. We're bringing you in. Just be patient. On, sorry. Yeah, be patient. Be patient. We're coming right to you. So, Sally, I know you don't traditionally like to get your hands too dirty with um, with liability, but you know, obviously, the 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 cloak has been laid down there, and I think I think what you would argue, would you not, Sally, is that well, incentivization is being enabled by street manager by collaborative roles, as you touched on earlier on. So. But, but, but what more incentivization do you think from a policy point of view might, might be possible, Sally? And, wh and what else would you add on this area? Um, well, just before I come on to incentivization, I just wanted to comment uh, on this liability point because I think it's also important to bear in mind that I think often when we talk about the joint work, people immediately think about the trend sharing. Uh, and it doesn't always have to be uh, trend sharing itself. So I think there's been some great examples out there of sharing the permit. So, you know, each individual promoter is still obviously responsible and liable for their trends, but it could be done under the one permit or the one set of traffic management. I think there's been also been some great examples of, for instance, where local authorities are planning to do some resurfacing, that they raise the permit, they do resurface after all the works have been done, uh, but they give a call out to any promoter that needs to do a job in that area and give them some time to do it. So I think it would be good to map out, as well as the end-to-end -end process, the different types of collaboration that can take place, because I think that may help, you know, bust some myths around where there might be issues. Um, obviously, trend sharing is the most difficult one of these, but again, I'm sure there have been some examples out there where people have managed to do this, there may have been a joint site safety risk assessment, for instance. So is there any good practice and some learning there that we can pull into uh, possibly next year review of the safety code? Could we have an extra chapter on this as well as the work that Samantha mentions on the coordination code? You know, as I said earlier, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are ways of overcoming some of these issues um, by breaking it down and thinking about them in more detail. Um, and in terms of incentivization, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, upfront prevention, incentivization is always a better way of achieving things than, you know, a, a stick in the form of a regulation or a punishment for doing something wrong. Um, so I'm very keen to do this in Street Manager now. We've got a little tag to say, is it a joint work or a collaborative job? That's a little nudge there for people to just try and think about this. But it also means we can start measuring some of this as we go forward. So potentially, could the number of joint and collaborative works that promoters do, could that get you a discount on your permits or your lane rentals? There's already incentives there for joint works uh, in the lane rental scheme. Uh, I've been uh, seeing some interesting examples, actually, of some promoters that have put incentives for joint works and collaboration in their contractor contracts. So instead of just paying them by, I don't know, the number of works they do or the time taken, but they also mark them and can pay them uh, on those types of incentives as well. Um, because again, there's, you know, there, there ought to be ways through some of these issues here. Okay, Sally, thank you for that. So yeah, I, I think, you know, what you've reinforced is this point about cradle to grave collaboration if we go back to some uh, the points that were made by samantha you know back in the research there's put this potential but all the way through to um you know beyond reinstatement and uh, and that um I, there's a mixture of questions and answers in the in the tote page here um allison has, has given a, a a thought in terms of um uh, you know, it, it doesn't seem likely that collaboration could be enforced, but the um, operational channel of equitable arrangement for collaborative is not insignificant, but a framework could be incentivizing collaboration by removing or limiting permitting and liability issues could be a great start, which kind of plays the theme we've touched on. 
And actually, Alan Rainford then comes back, as you see, at 235, where you talk about the trench share ranges, which you've already talked about. And I think we all know about the, the legal minefield and indeed the Croydon Connect project, which is uh, sought to unpick as much of that as we can. But let's come on then to um, uh, Mark Buxton's points and uh, question there. He says that one of the key drivers for motors is incentive. Using either the scorecard or street manager data, how much money have promoters saved on permits by collaborative working over the past six or 12 months? And I mean, I, I think the answer at the moment, Sally, if I'm not wrong, is, is fairly pitiful at this stage, but let's assume it isn't so very high. Let's build on your earlier point. And how do we I take that higher? I don't know, actually. Uh, uh, we don't have any data is the, is the honest answer about how much has been saved. Um, as I mentioned, uh, what we have as street manager at the moment is that flag about whether it was a joint work and I haven't yet seen the street manager data on that. Uh, we're just getting our reporting arrangements finally up and running. So uh, we'll be able to see that, I think, in time. Um, but I don't know whether any individual, how authorities might have some uh, data on this or indeed whether any individual companies uh, m measure this but it's an interesting measurement. yeah i i, I think I, I only know apocryphally it's very low it's 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 a it's minute uh, tenths of percents at the moment is, is what i'm led to believe um david do you have any better knowledge than that i'm sorry that there's one of the things we don't have is direct numbers but the feeling is that it is so low that is insignificant and in you know, and people have sought to incentivise certain collaboration within their permit schemes and the take up is really low. Single figure percentage and probably sometimes less than 8% of the works. And it seems to me that collaboration is probably the last option rather than the first option. And I think we need to sort of change our psyche and perhaps look at, you know, making this more the norm than the exception. And there was a, there's a point being made by someone in the, um, the chat room there about it highways authorities and i take the point highways authorities are as bad but if we could have this dynamic map then it's a visual thing that we could all see what's happening on our network and so we could all see the effect of what we're about to do or what we want to do and then we take and if we've got a framework that can deliver that then we're going to have different conversations how about addressing that? Uh, th thanks for that, David. And um, Samantha, do you want to add anything at that stage? Because I, I want to pick up on this point, David, about... Go on, Samantha. Um, I was just going to say, no, it, it's... I, I think... I think there may have been less collaboration on site during this past um, eight, nine months, purely because of social distancing as well. So I think... Um, and also the way in which jobs were postponed and then you know we, we've rushed to get works done so yeah. i think you know that that's probably a factor to consider uh, uh, early days but we look forward to mining that information sally when it becomes available and uh, in 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 due course through street manager because after all that's one of the uh, you know one of the strongly uh, purported outputs that we we look forward to let's just re let's just refocus again on adam brunskill's point at 240 there david and just you know explain for people more more generally why why uh, highways authorities are apparently reluctant to submit these forward planning uh, stuff for major work schemes um, and they're adjusting their programs at short notice is this just the nature of um, highways and local authorities activity or budgetary considerations or what yeah, I, I think part of the answer is the financial uh, way that these works are uh, procured. I mean, the, the it is really a yearly project for the highways authorities. Budgets are per year. They can have some money that's further a field for giant projects, and it's very much a moving feast for them in terms of organising the resources. But I don't see that as an excuse for not doing it. I, you know, it's just a re that's it that's the fact of life is the way in which we're funded is on a yearly basis and some of these things will change as any lots of contracts um, change in terms of dates for various reasons but the, the key to all of this is you can visually see what is the effect of that change and instead of just going ahead in a silo right we can't do it next week we're going to do it two weeks time and let's just go ahead and do it 
it's looking on that and thinking, oh, actually, if we go in in two weeks' time in this particular, I think it was Electricity North, where they they want to go in there, let's collaborate with them. Not try, you know, there's that sort of opportunity. That discussion is being missed right at the start, and any changes, therefore, within the program for whatever reason could be accommodated if we've already had those discussions. But as we've not had the discussions, they remain apart and in a silo and we're all going off. But uh, yeah, I mean, we accept that funding is a part, but also the way in which um, the works are procured is also a problem. But it, they are not in, insurmountable and they're problems that we could cure. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, what you point to is the fact is, you know, the responsibilities are on both sides to share yeah and identify opportunity unless we can share that information on the technology platforms you've talked about um, and it could, takes me back to the point you made earlier on David is the answer technology or is the answer mindset actually you're yeah. saying we got technology now uh, the mindset probably just needs to catch up a little bit with that yeah. On, yeah. On, to be fair on both sides um, now let, let, let's just dive into a, a little bit more detail. So Alistair Gavins at 2.39 uh, writes, um, excluding from Yorkshire, uh, excluding emergency asset failures, perhaps a differing standards of customer commitments from each utility and highways has to meet is, is an underlying barrier. These standards are very important, but maybe this may come with a new high level joined up approach. Um, any thoughts on the panel on that one in terms of a common approach or is this a sovereign right of highways and, and LAs to operate in their own way in that sense? I think that goes back to one of the comments I made around one of the blockers which is around the requirements we have to our customers which are set out by the economic regulators so there is it can't be ignored and it's not something that we choose to use as a oh well that's why we can't do it it's a fact and it's something we have to comply with in order to meet the you know the obligations of our our distribution licenses so it's something that needs to be looked at when we look at the process and factored in because unless the regulators change the the standards that we need to meet for our customers and they will only make them more stringent not less because we should be there to serve our customers in the best way we can then we need to factor those in rather than um do anything else with them you know they are only going to get more more stringent as time goes on and okay. the penalty not complying with those customer requirements there's both an economic um incentive from the regulator but it's also we're there to serve those communities so we want to do the best for our customers um so you know it's it's balancing the two david a, a high level joined up approach feasible possible reasonable yeah. over time for us to move in we're putting a five-year horizon yeah. on collaboration the vision what do you think can be achieved in that term and in, in this high level approach from your point of view I a uh, uh, couple of points, I guess. Obviously, we've got to harness the technology. It is there. And, I, and I'm going to see a, a note from Tom Lambert come up, which talks about the old uh, coordination meetings we all used to have since, you know, back in the 1990s, where we all s discussed programs. Sometimes there wasn't any programs. But we could have a more online dynamic coordination process. The technology is there. One thing we've learned from COVID is we haven't been using technology as much as we could have been. And this has changed the way in which we're viewing it. So why don't we just continually submit plans that you've got to do works and have a dynamic coordination process and then discuss the various, and then you can have an informed adult discussion at each coordination meeting or regular catch-ups to talk about the implications of what the works are trying to happen. I mean, and we've also can't set aside, you know, the climate change, issue here this has could have an impact on the climate change because we've got to do the change the way in which we um work we've got to build this circular economy idea and i've always held this sort of thing in my head that perhaps you know people are going ahead doing the work but you could have people in a region doing the reinstatement work and it could be for the highway authority the telecoms company the water company and we could have a, a different way of organizing the works and how we deal with it. There's a tremendous amount of opportunities. And I think we could get together 
as a group and set a, a high level aspirations, look at the technology, look at delivering a framework. And I think we could do it within the five years quite easily. This is something we probably within our own grasp, Sally, but is this, is, is this something you'd have a view on, if not a executive view of mandating anything in this area? Um, so just to say in terms of the technology, you know, Street Manager is now there to be used. You can load a forward plan. Anyone can load a forward plan, not just promoters about their forward plans of their works programmes, but highway authorities can equally load uh, their resurfacing programmes. You know, the more information that's provided out there, put on Street Manager, the more Street Manager can be used at whether it's quarterly or however frequently you have these meetings so everybody can see the opportunities that are coming up for the collaboration um, but there may be something um, that we could do again to incentivize loading of those forward plans we could maybe start thinking about linking provision of a forward plan with some other incentive Mm. Um, you know, we're currently looking at uh, a consultation early next year on some further regulatory changes. So could we, for instance, look at how, you know, permits are issued and might there be scope to do something different there? But could we link that with, you know, provision of a forward plan to incentivise and encourage? You know, we don't necessarily want to regulate that everybody has to provide those, but is there, you know, a cleverer, smarter way of doing this? Because... Uh, again, just to address the points David was mentioning, there is an imperative to work better and smarter and you know, collectively and modernise how we do things. So, yeah, so the technology is there. Let's use it. You know, if it needs developing and enhancing it, that can now be done as well. Um, you know, so I don't think technology was a barrier, I would agree, uh, until recently. But now it's there. And if you don't want to use Street Manager directly, again, the data is there. Um, could it be downloaded? Could it be used in other products like the one in London that Peter mentions? Um, so yeah, so I think there's there's opportunities here. Uh, and you mentioned Clive about the five years. I think you know if we don't grab this opportunity and put these things in place and start changing how we work, thing you know how we work, then in five years' time we're just going to find the existing problems and issues you know, and availability, et cetera, are just going to get worse. Okay. Excellent. Um, David touched on the environmental stuff and Diane's asked a question about environmental, but before we come on to Diane's question, which, which is a feed across from David's point about environment, I just want to pick up Janet Chapman's point at 247 about before we leave, should we say the nuts and bolts of collaboration. So what can be done to make collaboration more attractive and even more possible to those in as you have a large percentage of reactive works rather than proactive. Any thoughts on that? Um, I, I think I'll, I'll just go over the sort of bit we're trying with open reach in terms of working with Sheffield to just see if we can find a better way of working. Sheffield have divided their highway network into two zones, A and B. Um, 0, 1, 2 and traffic sensitive roads are going to be classed as A, 3 and 4 roads and anything that's not sensitive to the network is as a zone B. And there we're going to try and just see if we can expand the idea of having a permit that covers more than one road, use Street Manager and other products to see if we can develop a dynamic coordination view of what's happening and we're just going to let see how the works are coordinated and the opportunities for collaboration which arise. Now that's an early, we're going to try starting that round about 7th of December, a very small experiment, but Sheffield are really hooked into it because within their authority, they've been pushing collaboration for a number of years. So we could got the opportunity here to try some theories out and then see if we can come up with a better way of working. And within that, there will be permits at the moment, we are, we're saying that permits would be per road at a minor works rate, but there would be a discount because we would call them linked. So that deals with a major project. And there's no harm in looking at how you could, where this series of smaller projects come up with an incentivization program. The idea, the one thing about permits is with, because there's a fee, you can also develop an incentive. At the moment, 
the history has taught us if there's a rule and the only incentive is breaking the rule and there's a charge, it hasn't moved the industry forward as quickly as a fee has. Okay. And what about this point to do with reactive rather than proactive works in terms of uh, Janet's real, the depth of her question there? Is there anything or is, or is, or is that just, is that just not yeah. really going to be workable? Well, the reactive work again, looking at a map, wherever they've got these works to do, they could see who else is around because it's going to be an instant sort of dynamic view. The way in which the street manager is going to deal with starts and stops every two hours, you know, we, we're not hanging around for data anymore. It's going to be more current. So the opportunities to collaborate and work together increase. Okay, Samantha, anything else to add to that? Is that does that affect your you in your area so much or not? Um, yeah, not as perhaps so much as the water companies, but I think going back to um, my point I made earlier around the internal collaboration, as in where as a a single organisation, you've got several different activities that you need to do in a street at the moment because they're different activities, you need different permits for each one. So if something could be looked at around that so that it makes it more attractive to in effect nip in while you've got another job ongoing, it's easier to collaborate usually in your own organisation, not always but usually, than it is with external parties because you know it, you're the same company so some of the other liability issues disappear. So I think there's possibly something to look at around how to make it easier not every single job will ever will be able to be done in a collaborative way. but what we need to make sure is those that can be done in a collaborative way it's the easier and better way to do the work rather than it being the more difficult way and it's an exception rather than the rule so yeah. it is going back to the framework but also looking at some of the the legislative requirements to sort of tweak them to make these make more sense and I think you touched on a really interesting thing here. This is the collaboration can happen on a bunch, a bunch of various levels. It can be governmental between governmental departmental bodies. It can, but it can also be within a utility or within a bunch of contractors working for a utility, taking advantage of reactive work and completing some proactive works that are needed at the same time. Okay, um, let's move on then and come back to the uh, Diana Nuisance question, the 242 question in terms of the um, with some key contracts working across a number of highways, the utility concentrated gravity, is there an opportunity for delivering reinstatement in a more environmentally friendly way if we can nail the liability issue? I mean, obviously, build back better, green recovery, everything that that's speaking to, Sally, as a, as a government agenda, I know it will warm your cockles to hear that, even being touched on in a streetworks. Who would imagine that being touched on in a streetworks <laughs> conference a decade ago? But, uh, but now... Um, uh, as, 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 as Diane says, if we, if we nail the liability issue, what's, what's our thoughts on that? I, I think it's really encouraging that we're already thinking that way. You can sort of think that we, we've got to uh, look at the works we've got to do. And if we've got three or four works, a utility and a highway authority, why not have one person who's in that area to do it? I, know I, agree. Gonna... I agree and especially I think on some of the larger programs so um, yeah. I think maybe HS2 looking at working with some of their contractors to do some of these things as well and yeah it's always open you know to uh, more envi environmentally mm. friendly ways of doing reinstatements yeah. uh, but equally getting contractors to work together you know I think this is a, a key issue actually I mentioned before about um, you know, as as primary organisation, what more can you do with your contractors mm -hmm. to get some of these things in place as well? Because ultimately, if the contractors are incentivised to make changes, then they're very good at implementing these. Mm -hmm. So we can also use that mechanism as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, what's preventing um, where it, highway authorities got some works to do in the area? Utilities got to do the works, but why couldn't the highway authority do the permanent reinstatement? Similarly, why couldn't a utility contractor fill in a pothole that's nearby? The, the environmental savings would be immense if we, could, if we could get that off the ground. And, you know, I'll go back on the subject, but the technology is there to identify those things now because the, the, the data is around and we can capture it. So now we've got to move forward and just build the framework and the, and the momentum. 
providing everyone's populating the data. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's part of the mindset, yeah. not, not just the mindset of collaboration, but the mindset of the importance of providing that data, which, um, which, which, yeah. which, is, which is key. Samantha, you came off mute. Did you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I think in principle, it's a fantastic idea. I think in practice, there's some hurdles to overcome. But I think as the other thing this year has taught us, if you look at um, developments in the last week or so, things can that seem impossible can be delivered. So um, what I would say is when it comes to the contractors, they're working under contract. So that then puts the responsibility back on the utilities and the way that they operate their policies to make those contracts work in that sort of collaborative way in the future. Um, you know, it, it's not necessarily the contractors who will choose to work in a different way. Um, they may do, but it's the responsibility of the undertakers to kind of make that work as well. Um, with all the other things we've already discussed around liabilities and issues and mm. getting to the bottom of those. Okay. All right, we've touched on, I think, Peter Loft's point at 248 in terms of the multiplicity of approaches and the London IMA project being an example of moving us towards that. And I think it's a great example, Peter. Thanks for flagging that up. It doesn't really, I think you're, we're all nodding north-south at that. Um, Simon brings us on to another example in Hertfordshire County Council uh, between Caden Affinity, um, harnessing technology by real-time road closure and reopenings to the Highway Authority, incentivizing them to do so. Um, which is which is a good a good news story um, that that is, I know I'm aware of that particular thing you are David um, but it's uh, it's it's good to um, uh, hear that that's going on in such a mm. between between two two large promoters. Um, uh, Tom from Balfour's has come up at 2:59 and um, sort of offered the sort of the the clean sheet um, all bets are off type. Uh, uh, thing which, which 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 Tom frequently argues, I can might add, and uh, and uh, but uh, do 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 we do we think that, that that this is a this level of incentivization is the sort of thing that we really need to to dive into to to really bear some fruit? David, I'll let you have a crack at that one first. Yeah, it, it it's an absolute goal, isn't it? That that we need to move towards, and we shouldn't be again frightened of trying to move to that sort of area because you know but it's it's in ensuring that whoever does the job is done probably first time and nobody should go back that's got to be the ultimate aim of the whole industry and if we can incentivize it in some way and try and move this forward then it's really worth looking at so yeah. I'm, i think it's a you know that's something one of the things and one of the areas in terms of liabilities that we should touch on because it is obviously seen as a barrier and I think there's some things that we could do to move that forward. Okay, good, good. Anything else to add from panelists on that particular issue? It's just, uh, I think it speaks to, speaks to itself. Yeah, just to, just to say, I've always been interested in this idea of overall, you know, sort of monitoring and performance measurements. Yeah. Yep. And so I've always, you know, been interested because I've seen it work in other regulated policy areas where, for instance, you know, a certain a manufacturer or a company is rated based on a number of criteria and those criteria in this context could be like number of collaborative works you know how many defects they have for their inspections do you know what I mean how many um, you know how well the other performance measurements might might work and then they're sort of rated and then based on that rating they could then access certain discounts for permit schemes um, you know, discounts and any lane rental schemes, they could be trusted more in terms of how often they're inspected. So there may be a financial mm -hmm. benefit there. So this could potentially be one of those performance, you know, metrics that we mm -hmm. could potentially use in future. Uh, because then there's reputational benefits there as well, isn't there? So if you're an A rated company or an A rated contractor, you know, then that's good for you and your organisation. And there's an incentive there as well. Perhaps you could drive that at source, Sally, by reducing the street manager costs for the A, the AAA companies that uh, are performing well. Um, would that work, Sally? Um, well, we do naturally need to think about how the charging uh, regime for street manager is going to work after the next financial year. Um, so we do need to think about how 
you know they could be based in how they what they could be based on so again all all suggestions welcome at this stage yeah well i mean just let's leave that out there and certainly the scottish roadworks commissioner is in certain ways is handling uh, some of his stuff in that particular way um, in terms of um, you know reputational performance of uh, of of some of his uh, utilities and uh, and authorities up there as well okay um i did have some questions i wanted to go through with you as well because we touched on some of those ones as we've gone we've gone through on the panel one any further questions for the, for the panelists in the chat so please please write them in there um so so i think you know part of uh, collaboration is that talking about collaboration breeds good collaboration there's no doubt about that so you know it's just, it's a sort of if we go back to the, the point david made about mindset technology versus mindset um so how how the, the more we talk about it, the more it is the stuff the stuff we do around here as it were so how, how do you think streetworks can uk or, or or streetworks as a whole can can and, and how should we within our industry better showcase collaboration best practice is is there a, is are there a simple avenues that we do we just treat it as being common currency and 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 get people to sense that you know if you aren't demonstrating good collaboration on a frequent basis then frankly you aren't up with the hunt well i think part of the answer clive comes from the top from us that if you and I couldn't collaborate, then you, you know, and if Hawk UK couldn't collaborate, then you know, we, let's all go back to our silos. In, in, but as an organisation, as Hawk UK and and Jag UK and Streetworks UK, I think we should put collaboration at the forefront, and we should keep asking people how many collaboration opportunities have you had? You know, what has been the change? at that sort of data gathering level and street manager as Sally has alluded to is already asking those prompts and we could collect the data. Let's set up an, a group that looks at collaboration in its wider sense and build a framework that we think could work. Let's, in, you know, let's use the technology that's here and let's move that argument forward. We've got the, the trial that's going on with Sheffield. There's, there's other examples across the country. Let's learn from, these and then start looking at the, the, the big issues as such as liability as Sam has alluded to. Let's get a regulator, perhaps the regulator should have an, an interest in this to be fair because it's if this is making you work more efficiently perhaps there's something that you know there's an incentive there. Why should we just look at street works incentives? Why don't we look at incentives in the wider legal framework that you all operate in? So I think there's a number of areas, but I think all UK set up a strategic body and get them to drive that collaboration message. Yeah. Okay. Samantha, I think you can only nod north south at all that. Um. Yeah. Um. What I would say <laughs> that there are many, many, many incentives that we have to work to under the regulator. Wow. So yeah um it's a fairly regulated industry and there are some fairly challenging things to do so in order to make collaboration business as usual i think it, it's not necessarily about talking to the hawk community it's about talking to those people within our organizations and i'm referring now really to the streetworks um community around <sighs> the people who are planners you know and they they're aware of street works but it's not their day job in the same way that it's my day job or your day job so it's how do you make it accessible to them in a way that they understand and it is about frameworks and making things as simple as possible yeah Sal sally can i come to you and talk about thanks that aside, that's very clear sally can i come to you and talk about sort of strategic coordination we're starting to to draw towards the the end of our our session now um but we started today with matt matt warman and um and then we had uh, clive selly from bt openreach uh, uh talking to us and uh and and obviously you know looking at very much through the the telco lens and and the dcms lens of things um how, how do you feel about the sort of the cross-departmental collaboration um uh you know across government departments is there 
in 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 the street where it's fame because it's quite curious to see how much we certainly in my time in my three years here increasingly talking to dcms increasingly talking to the uh, off what or the environmental agency regulator uh in and in, in increasingly talking to bays about heat networks may i say your initiative by the way on that so thank you for that um but 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 sort of cross departmentally um, you know, D DFT isn't the first department we, we tend to think about always in a streetworks context across all our subjects now, which is a good thing because responsibilities are different. But how, 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 how do you think there is a, a role you have to play in terms of across White, the Cross Whitehall group that was referred to um, earlier on today by, um, by, by uh, Matt Warman and Richard Maddock? Oh yeah, so at official level, you know, we meet very regularly actually. So I meet often with Richard and his team along with uh, officials in DEFRA and Bayes, uh, Treasury on occasion, um, uh, and also actually within DFT. So we have other areas within DFT that's very interested in street works and what's going on and some of the latest policy initiatives coming down the line. Um, uh, and then the Cross Whitehall group, Anthony, who's my boss, he's uh, he's a member of that group that meets, I think, maybe every month, maybe every two months. Uh, and our ministers also meet quite regularly because DFT obviously has a role to play in delivering that manifesto commitment about broadband rollout. But equally, we have our own targets around installation of electronic charging points. Uh, and we also have a role to play in the whole decarbonisation and future of transport agenda. The street works and how we manage them sits pretty, you know, it's pretty key to all of those. It's part of uh, the, the most recent reforms we're thinking about doing our part of Project Speed. I don't know if people have heard about this, but this is linked to the Prime Minister's Build the Bill speech. So what can we do to help infrastructure delivery more generally and to help with the recovery from uh, coronavirus so we definitely do do a lot of cross-government collaboration and coordination uh, and then we obviously try and translate that into you know whether it's regulations or guidance or helpful initiatives working with the whole community uh, and just on that final one I, I do think there's a role here uh, for the community to play not just in the coordination code uh, but I believe Hawk England also may be working on putting some good practice together or some more myth busters around collaboration and joint works in particular uh, because I do think that's a good way to showcase some of the good practice. A part of that good practice is actually organisations that's found a way around the issues. You know, so the issues that were mentioned earlier on that list of things, you know, they found ways of dealing with that depending on the circumstances. So it would be actually be great to capture all of that and put it in some sort of document that the sector could then use. So when they experience an issue and something they might be trying to deliver, you know, they can see that colleagues elsewhere have tackled it and managed to overcome it. Um, because, you know, there is some great uh, examples out there. There is some good practice. It just needs to be, you know, adopted a little bit, you know, stronger and more comprehensively and for different types of works as well. But I'm sure it's all possible. Okay. All right, Sally. Well, thank you for that. Good. Any other uh, final comments from the panel? Because I think we're uh, we're we're pretty much exhausted all the uh, all all everyone's thinkings on these points at the moment. And 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 um, and Samantha, you quite rightly exhorted us to think more much more widely and much more broadly in terms of the the uh, the depth of our thinking from from both sort of the, the pre levels in terms of research all the way through to the to the back end and david you put on a, a platform there this aspect of hey the technology is here let's let's get the uh, the mindset created i think the thing that's interesting about collaboration is that in various ways it probably flows uh, you know into just about every every aspect of the vision whether it be you know adoption of innovation whether it be skills and training um, whether it be protecting the environment or whether it be digitalization they all have a componency where collaboration has a has a part to play in that so it is it is in it, in it almost one of the the foremost things and as you said right at the start david it, you, you know you couldn't imagine us having a vision without collaboration being in there at some stage so uh, yeah, i think you're you're absolutely right but um 
on behalf of everyone here this afternoon, let me let me thank you three for giving us your your very clear and open and honest views and reflections upon um, what is an extremely lengthy period of time in the industry for you, David, clearly from what you said earlier on, uh, a, a, less, a less period of time for uh, Sally and less perhaps for Samantha. But, but thank you for drawing together those threads and giving us what, what, what you've made clear in my mind also, as well as this sort of, should we say, the timeliness in terms of a program from pre-research all the way through. There's also the, the different gradations of collaboration, actually just simple stuff like I think Samantha touched on this idea of, you know, involving other departments around you within your own company is something we haven't talked a lot about. And, you know, with the best of the world, streetworks areas can sometimes be a little bit insular inside their own little company. You know, they'll be in a porter cabin out somewhere if they have a little office or they won't go to any office at all sometimes. They'll be roving around from Lincolnshire to South Wales without barely, barely a, a breath in between as we, as we well know, Samantha. Um, and um, so, and, and then all the way up and across departmental, I think that, that stuff feels like it's, do, it's done quite well, but it's, it's every, we need to focus on every single level of our, our mutual organizations of where, where that uh, collaboration can, can, can really go, go well. Someone's thrown in a point at the end here from Trudy McLeod saying, from his view, I think maybe we need a, a coordinator for collaboration to be successful. I'm not quite sure what Trudy had in mind there. Was it, was it a collaboration czar, you know, across, <laughs> across, our, across our industry? It sounds like a, it sounds like a frightfully good, uh, you know, she says exactly. It, it sounds like a frightfully good non-executive role. Um, at uh, many thousands of pounds a day for some aspiring person out there, not me. And uh, uh, anyway, but look, that's been a, a hugely in useful introduction to the subject. Um, David, thank you. Sally, thank you. And Samantha, as ever, um, sterling support. I'm now really just going to move on just to talk about the program for tomorrow. But uh, but for now. Um, people can't really clap on there, but you can put a hand up if you like, or or put a thank you or whatever in the uh, in the in the message tote there. But uh, or send an email. Send an email, but uh, <laughs> but, no, uh, but no, no, don't send an email. <laughs> <laughs> or not thank to Sunday. <laughs> Anyone who does have any examples of a yep. project, or if you could send them to the WA Com Secretariat, the Streetworks um, UK yep. email. Yes. so they can collate them all and then we can look at them as I say when we start to pull together this um, piece for the, co the coordination code so please if you have some examples do send them into the uh, secretariat thank and you. Are, you are you referring to that as appendix E Sam yes that, so, so if we you just code it as appendix E appendix E yeah so, for short, shorthand so, you know, if there's bits that you feel we need to expand on in chapter two, then, you know, just put a little note. But bits for Appendix C, this framework that we need to develop would be really useful. So thank you. Brilliant. OK, good, good, good. All right. We've still got uh, mid 30s people on the call. I just wanted to go through with you um, uh, a quick introduction to tomorrow. David and Please hop off when you want to. Welcome to yep. stay if you wish. Yep. Thanks, Clive. Um, I've got another meeting to go to. So OK, David. The rest of the conference goes well. Thanks, David. Thanks. Thanks very much. Bye. Thanks, Sally. Bye. Okay. Very good. Um, all right. For those who are uh, still on the still on the call, I hope you can see here. So tomorrow we're moving very much more to the digitalization focus here with the folks from uh, Geo uh, Geoscience Tech Advisor Holger Kessel, as you don't know him from from the NUAR project. Simon Top, who you saw asking questions earlier on from Elgin, and Kat Quain, really, really driving into this area of the vision to do with digitalization. And then in the afternoon, we are really going to try and flow into the aspect to do with streetworks policy. What are the, our expectations of things that are coming out of our current work with DFT and things that, that, that really do uh, make us sit up at the moment? And then the first of our sessions, which is, the, um, which is a workshop on the uh, excavated waste. So looking forward to that. Look forward to seeing you. Slightly earlier start tomorrow. We'll get things going at 9.30 uh, first thing in the morning. Look forward to seeing you then. Once more, a very big thanks and uh, 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 to our sponsors, Atkins and Scooby, uh, one of which we might hear from very briefly tomorrow. Thank you very much again to Samantha 
excellent session uh, still on the call and cheer everybody and see you uh, bright and early at 9.30 tomorrow. Thanks very much indeed. Bye-bye and good afternoon. Cheerio.